what is your game of the year? And can you back up that nomination? Can you explain how your choice is better than any other game released this year? Or perhaps you feel that's something better left to the professionals. In fact, why not put together a single all-encompassing game award show with a voting jury consisting of most of the largest and most influential, most well-regarded games media, and then consolidate those opinions into a singular authoritative award. That certainly sounds professional. And that's exactly what Jeff Keighley did. He created the Game Awards. The best game of the year, the best direction, the best character performance. These accolades, while seemingly distinct, all converge at the Game Awards. An event that has evolved into more than just a ceremony, it's a cultural phenomenon in the gaming world, marking a pivotal moment where the industry's creativity, innovation, and artistic prowess are celebrated. Winning an award sets the gold standard for every game that follows. And it's not just the industry that's watching, it's millions of gamers just like you whose time, emotions, and resources are woven into these virtual worlds. Over 100 million gamers, in fact, almost as many viewers as the Super Bowl. However, beneath the surface of this glitzy event lies a web of complexities and questions that need answers, potentially systemic problems, certainly large enough issues that we should talk about them. My name is Moriarty and my YouTube channel is really cool. Let me explain how I got here. A few weeks ago, the Game Awards nominees were announced and I found the nominees to be a little strange. There were exclusions of blockbusters and critical darlings like Armored Core 6, System Shock Remake, Octopath Traveler 2, and Hogwarts, which sparked debates. Was it simply a case of there being better games in a powerhouse year, or did it hint at a deeper issue in the nomination process? It wasn't just what didn't show up, however, but what did that caught my attention. Destiny 2 being nominated for Best Community Support a mere month after laying off almost their entire community support team, in the middle of a major community scandal, while also experiencing the largest influx of cheaters in the game's history? Well, that feels like a strange nominee. And the inclusion of Dave the Diver, a product of a massive billion dollar gaming corporation in the best indie game category, raises questions about what indie really means in this context. Bafflingly, Diablo 4 was nominated for Best Multiplayer, a feature that technically exists in the game, but is one of the most anti-multiplayer experiences you can have. Perhaps the question you're asking yourself right now is the same question I was asking as these nominees rolled in. Namely, who the heck is voting for these things? So I decided to look into it. A short and quick curiosity, and I've been looking into it now for weeks. My investigation into the Game Awards nomination and voting process has only led to more questions than answers. This video isn't about pointing fingers, but about understanding and improving a system that holds significant sway in the gaming world. I'm going to lay out my questions, one by one, and then explain explain why I think we need an answer for each one. I want to be fair. I want to be transparent. I like the Game Awards. I co-stream them every year. I respect Jeff Keighley. His contributions to the industry are undeniable, from his early days scripting for Leslie Nielsen at Cybermania 94 to his consistent involvement in gaming awards. His influence has been monumental. This is why it's crucial to hold the Game Awards to a high standard. They're not just an award show. They're a reflection of the industry's values and its evolution. And frankly, Jeff should know better. Let's jump into the questions. Who is voting for the Game Awards? This is actually a lot deeper than it sounds because I don't just mean show me a list of names. The Game Awards actually does exactly that. It shows you a list of names. The event lists names of organizations like LA Times, The Guardian, and NPR as part of its jury. But this only scratches the surface. From those organizations, who is voting? The Guardian alone has over 8 
thousand employees. It's crucial to pinpoint the individuals within these organizations who are casting the votes. The process behind arriving at these votes is also shrouded in mystery, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Most importantly here, however, is why don't we know who it is that is voting? You might be tempted to say voters should be anonymous. For example, no one knows who is or isn't a voting member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, right? The Oscars are determined by strange, murky silhouettes shaped vaguely like bags of turnips. Except contrary to popular belief, the Academy publicly lists its members, with a roster of around 10,000 individuals. It's not a small closed group, but a vast array of individuals bringing diverse perspectives to the table. We may not know how each person votes, but we sure do know who is voting. This contrasts starkly with the Game Awards, where the individual voters for most categories remain undisclosed. I say most because this this isn't even something that the Game Awards doesn't already do, as they do list individual voters for the accessibility category. Why not extend this transparency to other categories? Transparency here might seem dangerous to some. There's always an argument that if I know who's voting from IGN, I could somehow sway them, change their vote. But this isn't actually a likely outcome. Knowing who votes dramatically improves the ethical considerations of the awards. It's about accountability. When names are attached to votes, it's harder for conflicts of interest to go unnoticed. And we're going to talk about these conflicts of interests in just a moment. The fact that they exist at all is concerning, but more concerning is how long it took me to find them. These conflicts aren't just hypotheticals. They have tangible implications on the credibility of the awards. For example, what happens when a voter has a direct connection to a game or studio in contention for an award. This isn't mere speculation, but a reality that needs addressing. However, transparency is even lacking with regards to this list of names. The lack of direct clickable links to the outlets on the Game Awards website only adds layers to the opacity. When trying to research jury members, terms like level up, true gaming, and online station lead down a rabbit hole of ambiguity. This lack of straightforward information begs the question, why make it so difficult to identify and understand the voting members? Can you imagine any legitimate reason why an awards organization would purposefully not include links to the outlets that are voting members of their jury? Because I can't. There is no reason why it should be so difficult to figure out who is voting. The implications of this are far-reaching. The Game Awards isn't just an event. It's a significant influencer in the gaming industry. The games that win or even get nominated can see a surge in popularity and sales. It shapes trends, impacts developer reputation, and in many ways dictates the direction the industry moves. This isn't a critique just for the sake of critique, which leads me to dive into the second question. What is the process for arriving at a vote? This might seem straightforward, but it's anything but. The method of voting is not just a matter of tallying up preferences. It's a complex web of decision making that ultimately affects how valuable these awards truly are. Think about it. If the vote is based on a single editor's choice, that's a singular vision shaping the outcome. On the flip side, if the vote is an aggregate of an entire staff's opinion, it might dilute individual expertise and nuanced understanding of the gaming landscape. Both scenarios are problematic. Are these simply the game of the year winners that the outlet would otherwise have chosen, or is it a separate unique vote? And if so, why? Did the people voting play all of the games? Or, like is common with the Oscars, are they simply choosing the brand name they've heard the most from their kids? These issues actually become more concerning when you look at the members of this jury. Here are some examples I found especially concerning. The Verge, a member of the Game Awards voting jury, doesn't have a dedicated gaming department. Instead, Andrew Webster oversees gaming alongside several other types of media as a consolidated entertainment editor. He covers gaming, film, and television, and he openly admits to being a judge for the Game Awards, which is why I bring 
bring him up first. His qualifications aren't in question, but considering that The Verge does not cover gaming, except through Andrew, is it really The Verge that's voting? Or is it primarily Andrew's perspective, and why is it so hard to find out? Similarly, Wired's involvement in the voting process is unclear. They lack a designated gaming editor, and while Megan Farouk Manesh, a senior writer who previously worked at Vox's The Verge and Vox's Polygon, both also voting members, appears to be a senior figure in their gaming coverage, it's not evident if she is the sole voice for Wired in the Game Awards voting process. If not, there's no easy way to tell who else is contributing to the outlet. A simple Google search will reveal that several of the contributors there work for multiple outlets. I would like to think that they're not actually involved in determining nominees and winners, but we just do not know. And with regards to Wired, it's impossible to say whose voice is the voice of their vote. Pride.com has a vote, but with no visible video game editor or video game section. They don't even really cover games, their last review being in September, several months ago. And from what I can tell, every single article is written by a freelance contributor. My question, therefore, is simple. Who is voting here? Variety, owned by Penske, also has a vote. That's the same Penske that shut down Variety's gaming editorial branch in 2019, and now publishes gaming articles without bylines. I don't know where these articles come from, who writes them, or if they're even written by a human. God knows there's enough websites covering video games that just use ChatGPT to summarize other articles. I'm not accusing Variety of doing that, but the fact is that there's seemingly no identifiable writers and no editorial team. These instances underscore a worrying lack of clarity about who represents these outlets in the voting process. That's not even to start with the international outlets. Granted, I do not speak every language in the world, and therefore it's entirely possible, even likely, that I was unable to find the editorial staff for a lot of these outlets simply through my own inadequacies. However, it still remains a fact that I was unable to find the editors, the owners of the outlets, or sometimes even any staff at all. Alone, that wouldn't be concerning. But when looking at the outlets that I was able to find information on, well, I can't help but feel serious concern. Further, the interconnectedness of the gaming industry adds another layer of complexity. While researching this video, I decided to put together a visualization of the voting jury. This graph represents the voting members of all voting outlets from the US and UK, and then any other outlets that connect to them, and it reveals a tightly knit web of connections. What you'll quickly see is that, yeah, the entire US and UK industry is connected in some way, with only a couple very noticeable exceptions. Editors and writers often move between these organizations, creating a network where a few individuals may wield disproportionate influence. Red circles are the owners of the outlets, which is important because many times a single company owns several voting outlets, such as Reed Pop, who owns both Eurogamer and VG247, or Vox, who owns The Verge and Polygon, Penske, who owns Variety and VG Chronicle, Fandom, who owns GameSpot and Giant Bomb, or Future, who owns PC Gamer and Edge. Next, you have the smaller blue circles, which are the outlets themselves. The lighter blue, or I guess cerulean, turquoise, those are the voting outlets, the outlets on the voting jury, and the darker blue are other outlets that connect the black dots. The black dots are the editors-in-chief, managing directors or gaming editors for the voting jury. Just one from each outlet, I didn't add everyone, I didn't add the entire staff, I didn't add all the owners, I didn't pick and choose the best examples. I didn't add anyone that is too extraneous to the discussion. These aren't just the editors, the people actually driving decisions at these outlets, and likely are also the people who are voting, assuming that the editors are the final deciding votes for what gets nominated. It's really surprising how close the entire industry really is. I could not make a jump longer than three steps. The longest connection that I could make make was Digital Trends to Game Informer. 
Digital Trends is a member of the voting jury, and its head is Giovanni Colantonio, who previously worked at The Inventory, a subsidiary of Geo Media. This connection extends to Keza McDonald and Brian Shea, both former Kotaku employees, another Geo Media outlet. McDonald and Shea have both worked for IGN, another organization with voting rights in the Game Awards. Currently, Shea is the editor at Game Informer, also a voter. McDonald's journey includes roles at Eurogamer and VG247, both voters, and she is now with The Guardian, which recently sold NME, another voter. That is the furthest connected group of people on this board, and it still connected three individuals across multiple voting entities. So yes, it's incestuous, incredibly so. But the Game Awards has to work within the construct of the industry it operates in. It can't simply change the industry, except of course that the Game Awards is the one choosing who gets to be on this jury. What quickly becomes more concerning, however, are examples like Min Max. Min Max is a 40,000 subscriber YouTube channel and an accompanying 10 to 100,000 listener podcast. Started by Ben Hansen and his friends, all ex-Game Informer staff, it now has a vote at the Game Awards. This includes Kyle Hilliard. Kyle was, in 2022, rehired by Game Informer as Magazine Content Director. And now, Kyle may potentially vote with MinMax and then also vote with Game Informer. This overlap raises questions about the independence of these votes. And if I were to add Kyle to my web, he would mess it all up because he was also the mobile game editor for GameSpot, he worked for Polygon and IGN and the Washington Post and Game Mill, the game publisher, and Future and Games Radar, and frankly, my entire graph would spiderweb to surround Kyle. Kyle represents what is very common in this graph, someone who may have influence over more than a single vote. Kyle has the opportunity to vote with MinMax, and then to vote again at Game Informer. MinMax also has Anna Diaz, who is currently also working for Polygon, which also gets a vote. And also on MinMax, Jeff Quirk, who also works for 50CC, a video game publicity company. You're going to hear more about them later, so remember the name. This is why it's so very important that we know who is voting and what the process for arriving at that vote has been. Without knowing this, I can't say for certain that some individuals don't have unethically outsized representation. Take, for example, Tamur Hussein, who is the creative director for Giant Bomb, a voter, and the managing editor for GameSpot, also a voter. I find it unlikely that his opinion varies all that much from a meeting at GameSpot to a meeting later that day at Giant Bomb. But because we don't know who votes or how they vote, is it unreasonable to question whether Tamur is being counted twice? This response responsibility lies with the Game Awards. It is their responsibility to ensure that we know this is ethical, that the voting is not being exploited. Before you head down to the comments and tell me how this is just about video games and who really cares about some dumb gaming award, let's be clear that gaming is a larger media market than movies or music. It's not just a cultural behemoth, it's also a financial titan, representing over $200 billion a year with trillion dollar companies in play. A Game of the Year award absolutely helps move units, as evidenced by Ubisoft's willingness to put out a Game of the Year edition of Far Cry 6, even though it didn't win any Game of the Year awards. The award title is valuable. It helps sales. It increases prestige. It likely allows some of these companies to hire better people who want to be part of an award-winning team, and all sorts of other ancillary benefits beyond simply having a metal statue in the corner of the office. While video game award shows might ultimately be a silly, subjective topic, with content that by its very nature can never please everyone, one, it is more than a couple of guys getting together on a podcast and saying which games they personally enjoyed. Understanding who votes and how they vote at the Game Awards isn't just about satisfying curiosity. It's about ensuring ethical standards in an industry where the lines between journalism, entertainment, and commerce are increasingly blurred. It's about maintaining the integrity of an award that carries immense weight in the gaming world, shaping trends, sales, 
and the direction of the industry. Knowing the process and who is involved in it can also alleviate concerns that massive developer ad budgets and potential promises of exclusive access are not swaying voters. And about those voters, does the jury actually vote? Because we don't know who votes or how they vote, we also don't know if they actually do vote. This is a simpler question than the previous one, but the implications stretch far beyond mere curiosity, touching on the very legitimacy and integrity of the awards. Consider a hypothetical scenario where a major media player like the LA Times abstains from voting. This would have two effects. First, it would reduce their participation to mere tokenism, undermining the credibility of the awards by making it clear that they were added for nothing more than clout. It is understandable to an extent to have them on board in the first place. You get some amount of free marketing and publicity from the LA Times, a major media conglomerate. However, if they are not voting, that raises questions about the validity of the vote when members are added to the jury with no intention of voting at all. Secondly, if significant members of the jury don't vote, it skews the voting percentages, potentially leading to outcomes that don't truly reflect the industry's collective opinion. Since we don't know if votes are happening or not, the worst case hypothetical is still possible, namely that graft and corruption are more easily possible. If there's only 10 voters and I know one of them, I can more easily change the outcome of the vote. The situation gets more complex when individual voters have past or present associations with game developers or publishers. Take Andy Robinson from VideoGamesChronicle.com, for instance. Andy is the editor-in-chief and likely is the final vote for that outlet, as it's a reasonably small one. However, just prior to accepting a position as editor, Andy was a writer and marketing manager for Playtonic, a video game developer who has made games such as Ukulele, and before that was a publicist at Bandai Namco. Hypothetically, imagine if a Bandai Namco game was nominated for awards and Andy were to be voting on those games. Would that not raise questions about potential conflicts of interest? I bring this up because last year, a Bandai Namco game was nominated for a a lot of awards, Elden Ring, and it eventually went on to win Game of the Year. Did Andy recuse himself from voting in such situations? Without transparency, we can't even have the discussion about whether or not he even needs to, because Andy worked at Bandai for three months, seven years before Elden Ring was released. However, he did write Ukulele, so if Ukulele 2 is nominated next year, well now we just can't be sure. And this lack of clarity opens opens the door to potential ethical dilemmas. While having former video game publisher or developer staff voting on game awards is in and of itself a conflict, it is further exacerbated when another member of the jury does not vote or was added as a token member, because now this potentially compromised vote has more power simply by existing in a smaller pool. Combine that with the broader context where developers, journalists, and marketers all often cross paths in their career trajectories again and again, creating a complicated web of relationships. It necessitates a robust framework of transparency and accountability, especially in contexts like award voting, where impartiality is crucial. The potential for conflicts of interest isn't just a theoretical risk. It's a real challenge that needs addressing. Who selects the jury? And more importantly, why were certain people selected? This is the big question for me. Who is it that decided which outlets are given a vote? Why does a YouTuber like MinMax with 40,000 subscribers even have a vote in the first place? Is this simply because of the connections to their former employer, Game Informer, rather than any achievement of their own? And does that connection mean they are somehow seen as more qualified than other press in the new media space? Further, if they are getting the position exclusively because of their ties to another voting jurist, does that not raise questions about their impartiality? There are a lot of people on this list that don't make sense to me. YouTubers, podcasters, government
government officials. The jury list is confusing, and I keep finding myself saying, what's the determining factor for membership in this jury? It's like peeling an onion, each layer revealing more questions than answers. Consider Dennis Patrick, for example, the founder, manager, and news editor for Game Ranks, a YouTube channel with over 7 million subscribers. You've probably seen some of their videos before, as they do very popular top 10 videos. However, why is Game Ranks on this jury at all? Is it because they have a couple million subscribers? But if so, why aren't other popular multi-million subscriber game reviewers like Lazy Game Reviews or Girlfriend Reviews also on the voting jury? Perhaps they aren't large enough. So if it's just about size, why not popular MMOs? Why not Sniper Wolf? Another example is Ralph Panabianco, otherwise known as SkillUp, a YouTuber with over 900,000 subscribers and he is also on the voting jury, so that really throws a wrench into our discussion because clearly it's not just about size, which makes it even less understandable why some YouTube game reviewers are on the jury and others are not. What is the cutoff here? Boogie2988 won a The Game Awards award for Trending Gamer in 2016. He covers video games, he has millions of subscribers, and yet even before all the controversies, he never had a vote. Read the owners of VG247 and Eurogamer also owns GameIndustry.biz, arguably one of the highest authority video game outlets in the world, and yet GamesIndustry.biz does not have a seat at the table, while those other two read pop properties do. Worse still, VG247 is essentially a news aggregator that features one or two game reviews a month, primarily written by contributors that also contribute to Game Informer, GameIndustry.biz, in NPR, Polygon, Variety, GameSpot, and more. Yet somehow, those same articles that lead to a jury position on VG247 do not on GamesIndustry.com. Biz. The puzzle extends to Future PLC's properties. Future owns PC Gamer, Edge, and Games Radar Plus. Of those, PC Gamer and Edge are voting members of the jury. However, Edge does not have any video game writing staff. The staff of Edge is very literally just the staff of Games Radar Plus. They are one and the same, which makes it even more bizarre that Edge is a voting member, but Games Radar Plus is not. This discrepancy in representation raises questions about the selection criteria. Entertainment Weekly's presence on the jury, despite not publishing a game review in three years, exemplifies this conundrum. It suggests that inclusion might be more about amplifying the game Game Awards reach and less about the jurors' current engagement with the gaming world. It's not just about who is voting or how they're voting, but also the very foundation of their selection. If the criteria for jury membership are opaque or seemingly arbitrary, it casts a shadow on the legitimacy of the votes. It creates an environment where the awards could be perceived as less about celebrating gaming excellence and more about marketing and reach. We we don't know who is voting, we don't know how they're voting, we don't know that they actually do vote, and we have no idea why these people are on the jury in the first place. This leads me to my penultimate question, what safeguards prevent vote contamination? This is an issue that echoes across various award shows, but it seems particularly pertinent here. If all of these previous questions sound impossible to answer because there's no way to protect journalists from being harassed, no authority to ask them to abstain from discussing their votes, no way to allow deliberations on trickier decisions without reintroducing the same problems, or even just that providing transparency won't help alleviate the problems enough, I have to point you to other award shows that have long addressed these exact problems. There are some processes that other award shows already do that the Game Awards should also do. In fact, they may already do them. We have no 
idea, but any they do implement would only further be strengthened by transparency and openness. Confidential agreements are a standard practice in many award shows, designed to safeguard the integrity of the voting process. Certainly, this is just a formal piece of paper. It's a common refrain that NDAs are for the public, not for friends. However, it's not about the document. It's about fostering a culture where these standards are respected and upheld. Independent voting is another cornerstone of a robust award system. Jurors are often encouraged to vote independently, using private ballots and secure online systems. This is essential in maintaining the individuality of each vote, free from undue influence or groupthink. Knowing who the other jurors are is a big help too, since if you don't know who you're not supposed to talk to about these things, it's hard to avoid any inadvertent discussions or influence. Clear judging criteria are crucial for any award. The Game Awards, for example, has a category for Best Game Direction, but the criteria are vaguely defined. Awarded for Outstanding Creative Vision and Innovation in Game Direction and Design. This is not a very clear criteria. What is Outstanding creative vision. What is innovation in game direction? They used the term in a recursive definition. The best game direction has innovation in game direction. It's no wonder that almost every year the best game direction is simply a repeat of the game of the year. Clearly, the best directed game is the best game. This kind of vague, unclear criteria simply leads to bad voting, and that's especially relevant when you have clear non-gamers on your voting jury. It's the Game Award equivalent of American football's MVP and Offensive Player of the Year. One is the most valuable player, MVP, and the other is a runner-up that isn't a quarterback. Incidentally, a reminder that the Game Awards has more viewers than the NFL. A statement of ethical guidelines is another key element. It's it's not enough to assume that jurors understand the expectations. These should be explicitly stated. Guidelines addressing issues like lobbying, bribery, and conflicts of interest not only set the tone for the voting process, but also serve as a public commitment to integrity and transparency. If some sort of a tricky vote comes up that requires a group decision, jurors should also be given an opportunity to discuss and debate in a controlled environment, overseeing by a neutral facilitator. The Game Awards can then ensure that all perspectives are considered and prevent discussions from being swayed by the most vocal, influential, or when famous YouTube stars are part of the discussion, famous members of the group. Some award shows also regularly rotate their jurors to avoid the formation of biases or cliques within the jury. This practice, however, is only effective if the public is aware of the jury composition, which circles back to the need for transparency. And then all of this can be presented to the public transparently post-decision. Some awards disclose voting results or provide summaries of jury discussions after the awards are announced to demonstrate transparency. There is no legitimate reason why semi-anonymized voting records cannot be given to the public to ensure that things are being done ethically. And ethics are important here because the industry is incestuous and very, very close. For example, the Game Awards uses 47 communications for media relations. 47 also does press outreach for Capcom, Warner Brothers, Electronic Arts, Sega, I Am 8-Bit, and others, and is itself owned by Keywords Studios, which is a game developer and publisher working closely with companies like Electronic Arts, Nintendo, Xbox, 2K, Sony, Activision, Epic, and Paradox. To me, it's not a good look when the people answering the emails for your unbiased video game awards show are also the people sending you press releases from games that have been nominated for awards. It's a conflict.
conflict. And just to highlight how closely related all these people are, do you remember that I mentioned 50CC, where one of the podcast hosts for Min Max works? That company was founded by one of the account coordinators from 47. It's a small industry on top of a massive one, and the only way we get away from the Ouroboros of it all is to be more transparent about everything. Max Mallow is the managing editor for Double Tap. Previously, he worked for Activision Blizzard's Major League Gaming. Double Tap is a voting jury member for the esports categories, which is much smaller and consists of only 17 members. That means that Max is potentially voting on at least one category where his former employer is, at the least, tangentially involved. And he represents 6% of the entire vote. But it doesn't stop there because Max was also an editor when Rachel Samples worked at Double Tap. Today, Rachel is the managing editor for Dot Esports, another voting jury member of the esports category. These connections, while perhaps innocuous, can cast a shadow of doubt over the impartiality of the voting process. When the connections are so close, all it takes is just the whiff of impropriety to contaminate the results very quickly. Like dominoes, if one person is involved, what's to say his close network isn't as well? And when the network is this close, that's just the entire thing. And so finally, why hasn't the Game Awards fixed these issues already? Jeff Keighley has been instrumental at championing and shepherding video game awards from the very first one in 1994 all the way up until today. He recognized the need for an award show that not only acknowledged but deeply respected video games and their community. His vision was to celebrate the artistry, technology, and storytelling that define modern video games. Games, not just hand out accolades. The award show has evolved into more than just an award show. It's a platform for major announcements and showcases, making it a cornerstone event in the gaming calendar. This isn't Jeff Keighley's Game Awards, it's THE Game Awards. It's one of the largest media events in the world, reaching over 100 million views and growing every single year. The scope is staggering, surpassing the viewership of traditional media events like the Grammys, the Emmys, the CMAs, or the Oscars. It's the largest, most watched award show, and possibly the most watched gaming media of the year. The numbers rival the Super Bowl. With such a massive audience and influence, it's logical to hold it to a higher standard, especially in terms of transparency and ethical voting practices. Yet, despite its size and impact, the Game Awards maintains a veil of secrecy over its voting process. It publicly divides the vote between a 90% jury decision and 10% viewer input, but the specifics of who votes, how they arrive at their decisions, and the criteria for jury selection remain shrouded. This lack of clarity is not just a minor oversight, it's a significant concern that potentially undermines the integrity of the awards and by extension, the industry it represents. Further still, if jury members are compromised, if Game Awards winners are being picked by jury members that were added for token purposes, if jury members are picking winners based purely on their brand recognition over true worthiness, then it's a disservice to the industry. Worse, it may actively be harming the health of the industry. In an environment where sales and marketing are so closely tied to these awards, the potential for bias and corruption is not just a theoretical risk, but a practical concern and temptation. This video isn't created from a place of criticism for the sake of criticism. I am a fan of the Game Awards. I will be co-streaming it again this year. I enjoy the fanfare of getting to celebrate my favorite pieces of media, of being involved in my favorite pastime. And I'm not asking for extreme changes either. It's not like I want a 100% user-voted system or something like that. We'd get meme games winning Game of the Year and it would be much, much worse. However, seeking transparency in a 100% 
higher standard shouldn't be seen as extreme. It's a reasonable expectation for an event of this magnitude and influence. I made this video because I don't have all the answers even after spending weeks looking for them. And it shouldn't be this hard to figure out who is voting and why. I don't think that kind of obfuscation is good for the industry. As gamers and lovers of this medium, we deserve to know that the accolades given at the Game Awards are earned through a process as fair and transparent as the games they aim to celebrate. Thank you to my patrons. My name is Moriarty. My YouTube channel is really cool, and I'll see you on the next one.